Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Dr. Rosemary Pena, and I'm adjunct professor of German studies at UBC Vancouver, and the president of the Black German Heritage and Research Association. Dr. Emily Fraser rath and I welcome you to our second public event together as part of the BGHRA's All Black Lives Matter series and in cooperation with Davidson College. We are delighted to welcome our special guest speaker, Dr. Natasha Kelly. Emily and I had the pleasure of hosting Dr. Kelly in an engaging conversation with our students this morning. So we are certain that you'll be pleased that you decided to join us this evening. But before we begin, I'll ask Emily to please introduce Dr. Kelly and our moderator, BGHRA Vice President Kavina King, after acknowledging our sponsors and sharing just a little about our work together at Davidson College. Emily? Thank you, Rosemary. And it is such a pleasure to be here tonight to um, invite both Natasha Kelly and uh, Kavina King, and also to be in community again and always with Rosemary Pena. Um, it's a real exciting event for me to see the Davidson community and also the BGHRA coming together uh, tonight. So again, my name is Emily Fraser rath and I'm a visiting assistant professor of German studies at Davidson College located just north of Charlotte, North Carolina. Today, as I mentioned, I have the privilege of introducing doc Dr. Natasha A. Kelly and Kavina King to Davidson College and to the BGHRA. This talk is made possible by the German Embassy and is part of Davidson College's Campus Weeks program. Our conversation with Natasha today is also the next installment of the BGHRA Black or Black German Heritage and Research Association, All Black Lives Matter series, as Rosemary mentioned. Beginning in the spring of 2021, the BJHRA has invited scholars, activists, and artists whose work and lives intersect with, influence, shape, and inform Black German studies to share their experience, expertise, and stories with the BJHRA community and beyond. Several of our most recent videos include conversations between our guests and students in Dr. Pena and my co-taught class at Davidson College entitled Black German Art and Resistance. All of the videos in this series, including our class conversation with uh, Natasha from this morning are available on our YouTube channel entitled Black Germans. A recording of today's talk will also be featured in this web archive. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the German Embassy for making Natasha's virtual visit possible and my colleagues in German studies at Davidson, Burkhard Henke, Scott Denham, and Maggie McCarthy for their support and encouragement. I also want to extend my deepest thanks to our department administrator, Meg Sawicki, as well as Jennifer Joyce and Susan Caldwell, who work behind the scenes here at Davidson doing all of the logistics work. Finally, Rosemary and I would like to thank our students in Black German Art and Resistance for all of their thoughtful questions, their curiosity, and their hard work this morning with our meeting, uh, in our meeting with Natasha and also um, this semester in general. Thank you, Danai, Katie, Kari, Garrett, Gavin, Pat, Raphael, and Stephen. We hope you have watched and enjoyed as we have Dr. Kelly's film entitled Millie's Erwachen or Millie's Awakening. This film debuted at the 10th Berlin Biennale in 2018, and it's an award-winning documentary that has also traveled internationally and features self-narrated stories of Black German women artists. I'd like to introduce today our moderator for our conversation uh, before we get started. Kavina King is the vice president of the BGHRA and a PhD student in German and Scandinavian studies at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. She is working on her dissertation entitled Black German Radicalism and Resistance in the 21st Century. Kavina is a project and research assistant at the US UMass Amherst DEFA Film Library, where she curated the virtual film series, Black Lives in Germany, Resilience, Art, and Hope. Recently, she joined the Department of World Languages and Culture at Howard University to teach German and Black German studies. Welcome, Kavina. 
And finally, um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Natasha A. Kelly, who is currently the Max Cotta Visiting Professor of German in the University of Rhode Island uh, Modern and Classical Languages and Literatures Department. Dr. Kelly's work as an author, curator, and visual artist has been celebrated and exhibited across Germany and the world. Afrokultur, the theatrical adaptation of her dissertation, which was entitled Afrokultur der Raum zwischen gestern und morgen, or Afroculture, the um, space between yesterday and today, or and tomorrow, sorry, um, debuted in Brazil at the Goethe uh, Theater and last year in the US. Dr. Kelly's edited volumes entitled Sisters and Souls, uh, first out in 2015 with the second edition Sisters and Souls 2 out just this last summer, um, were met with great acclaim and uh, were published this last summer in honor of the 25th anniversary of Afro-German poet Maya Yin's death. There are many creative works and publications that precede Natasha, and we will link to all these projects in the chat here tonight and also below the video um, on YouTube. Without further ado, um, it is my sincere pleasure, as I've said before, to, um, to introduce Dr. Natasha A. Kelly and Kavina King. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. Uh, Dr. Kelly, welcome. I am super excited to be in conversation with you today. Um, I admire your work and have been following it for a while, so this is quite a treat. Um, and I'd like to, yeah, express a warm, especially today, a very warm welcome uh, to New England as well, um, where I currently am uh, greeting you all from. Thank you everyone in the audience uh, for being here uh, today as well. Uh, many exciting things going on out there, and we are happy that you joined us today. Um, in your conversation this morning uh, with the wonderful students at Davidson College, you said that your film wouldn't have been at the 10th um, Berlin Biennale. Uh, and that you were invited by an all black uh, curatorial team. Can you talk a little bit more about that moment and what did it mean to you personally uh, to be recognized in that way? Um, well, there, there, there are different sides to the story. First of all, um, like I mentioned this morning already, I know I wouldn't have been invited if it would have if if the Biennale would have been curated by the, your classical white male uh, heterosexual curator. Um, it so so this is definitely something that that changed the structure of this inst institution of the Biennale to actually have an, an all curatorial team also of five people, which was also very unusual. Usually it's one person or maximum two. I think this was actually the first time in 20 years that they had a team all black people from all different parts of the world, Afro-German, Brazilian, US American, um, African, two Africans. And it was, um, it was a fantastic experience. And to tell you the truth, at first I had no idea where I'd landed. You know? For me, this was just um, working with this team and working, having the chance to, um, to um, yeah, exhibit on an international platform was great, but I never thought about, oh, this is the Biennale until actually a friend of mine said, do you even know what the Biennale is? It's like the Ferrari under the exhibitions. This is like, you can't get bigger than that. And that's where the first time where it actually clicked. And I actually realized um, how huge this potential was. And um, it showed, it, it showed, it proved itself because um, that's the way I got to, to literally travel internationally with my film and I and still am after two years, three years now. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about your travel? Because you have 
been this and the film has been worldwide and um at the same time uh, i remember you also saying this morning and also in other instances um on social media but also in interviews that um your work isn't recognized by the white majority uh society in in germany and here you are worldwide with your film. Can you talk a little bit about how that's even possible and where you've been and which exciting places and projects you've uh, been a part of? Well, Millie's Awakening really literally took me once around the world from Germany, from Berlin to the USA. I did a tour throughout the USA in 2019. I was in Australia, it was screened in India. I was in Brazil. Um, the only continent that I haven't screened on is the African continent, and I'm still waiting for the African premiere, which would be uh, would be amazing. Um, definitely not undifficult with um, with some of the topics in the film, but um, still something that that is definitely top of my bucket list. And I think the amazing thing for me, not only being allowed to travel once around the world, but also um, was the different perceptions people had of the film. Um, it was amazing to see um, that there were certain, certain elements in the film where um, everybody reacted around the world in the same way, but there were other elements where in the USA, somebody wouldn't react at all, but in Australia, it would be a huge thing. No? So, and this was for me, um, my learning process was through the perception of the film, no? through how these different audiences really, um, really perceived it. And, and even the differences in, in countries individually. Um, in, the, in the USA here, I've screened at universities, I've screened in education contexts. I was also um, at cultural centers. I was at Sankofa in, in, um, in DC, next to Howard University, had a screening there. That was also a very emotional screening for me, I would say, because the audience, it was um, a lot of the old Panthers were there. And um, it was interesting to see that um, Black US Americans only know our history up to the Second World War, but not beyond that, no? And um, I think that is really fatal for us as Black Germans to, um, to have people start telling our story with the Second World War. Because as Maya Yim already um, proved in, in her book and Katharina Ogontoye, Farbe Beken, or Showing Our Colors in German, Afro-German history goes way back, way past the 17th, 18th century, which actually you can see in art, you know, um, where you always have one or two black models pop up somewhere and you ask yourself, how did they actually enter these pictures? And that was the question I was actually asking or I'm asking now. That's why I named my film Millie's Awakening. And it has become a project with, with, where, with so much follow-up projects that have come out of this film. And I'm actually researching, looking for where Millie is, who she was and how she actually came into the painting of Ernst Ludwig Kirchner, which was um, painted in 1911 in Dresden in East Germany. So she must have been there. And the question is, how did she get there? And I'm actually doing um, an exhibition at the Kunsthalle in Bremen, showing my interim research next year. So, yeah. So that means you probably can't tell us too much about what you found so far about Millie. Is that right? No, not really. Not not yet. Not yet. Okay. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. But um, but you can keep um keep your eyes open and and watching and waiting for it because um, I will show it visually, but also uh, in writing. A lot is coming. It's on on its way in the making. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Great. So uh, maybe a Millie's Awakening Part Two. Um, do do you, um, Millie's Awakening was your first documentary, uh, but you've had other projects that uh, are available uh, uh, and, and, and visual communication is something that is really, and seems really important to you. Um, can you talk a little bit more about 
the importance of that for you personally and how you came into, yeah, communication and looking at Black Germany under that lens. Mm -hmm. Well, communication studies is something that I always wanted to do. I, it, um, it used to be called publishing in Germany, but then it switched to communication studies because of the new media, internet, social media, etc. So I always wanted to be a journalist. In my teenage years, I was writing for the school paper and, you know, worked at different newspapers in Germany and thought I would do a have a classical journalistic career. But um, that came out completely differently. I, I, if you would ask me if I would ever go into, if I would even ever do a doctor title, that was not on my list. Or to teach, um, to, to do research or to become a professor, that was far from, it was unthinkable at the time. And visual communication, I started out with linguistics because um, I'm fluent in, in English, as you can hear, very British, but um, more comfortable in German. And so I, I, I started with these two languages and French, actually, but I dropped French uh, a few decades ago, learned to become a translator. And so, so I was doing a lot of linguistic work, analyzing language and, um, and that. And... Um, through my interest to Black German studies, which, which started in, in my youth practically, it's like the story of my life, um, I combined them both. And it was a, only a matter of time until I started researching or picked up on Maya Yim's research, actually, of um, racism and language and went deeper into that. And then feminism was only a step away, practically. Um, and then that became a big thing. And then it, it, the intersection and in, intersectionality and it just, the whole thing just exploded. But um, during, teaching back then at the Humboldt University in Berlin, I realized that it's also really difficult to teach topics like racism and um, sexism, feminism or structural issues generally um, through language, through text. And that's when I um, um, started using art to actually communicate um, these topics much better, much easier. Um, not to say that there's no, no racism in the artist world, that's definitely, but um, really using visual communication to, to communicate these untouchable phenomena. Hmm? Yeah, and you seem, um, you seem to have that in common with the artists in uh, Melissa Avachen in uh, Melissa Awakening as well. Did um how did how did you how did you meet these fascinating artists? Um, um yeah, I'm interested. Well, some of them I've known for fairly for a fairly long time. Our our kids grew up together practically in community wise. And um, the first, um, the first, my first interview partner who I met was, was Nadu. She's the mask ma maker, the one you saw last. And she came to one of my theater performances. Um, we were standing on stage after the theater performance. And um, well, I told this story this morning. That's why it's funny to tell it again, but I'll tell it again anyway. And um, we were in the newspaper. There was an interview. Um, I was interviewed as the theater director by a black journalist, a black woman, and I was obviously talking about my Ayim because the theater performance is dedicated to my Ayim, and we had a full spread that day. And she came to us after this, the show and she said, yeah, she's like 60 odd and said, this is the first time in my life that I've experienced that three black women are on a full newspaper spread um, at once. Um, and, and she was like, and that's what made her come to the show. And then, but then she said that the interview was great. She said, but you forgot something. You forgot about us, the 60s and 70s, um, the generation before Maya Yim, where there were all, also women's organization, women's organizing. The medium of the time was radio. So of, of obviously it wasn't so widespread like the internet or social media, but it was the thing at the time, right? And, um, she, they were on radio, they were to, um, communicating their issues, they were um, calling for other black women to join them, um, they were political, they wanted to write a book. 
So she started to tell the story. We were on the stage, like 15 people, and none of us had ever heard anything about it. And at first I wanted to, to do my film about these two decades, the 60s and the 70s, where we have fairly nothing, no information on the Black German community that is documented. You know? And we have a lot about the um, post-war generation. We have a lot from the 80s onwards, but the 60s and 70s is really a gap, it's a space. And so I started researching, found a lot of women who were active in that time, but they didn't want to go on camera. And I was at a poetry slam where I met the youngest who was um, performing this piece about black women, which she, do, she does in the museum in front of Millie. And um, so I had the oldest and I had the youngest and there were 40 years difference between these two. So um, I started looking for people that would fit in between, for women next that would fit in between. And um, that's how it came, came to be. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, let's get to uh, an audience question here and comment. Let me see. A little bit long, so bear with me. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth, uh, for sharing your question. Um, Elizabeth asked a number of artists featured in the film and you as the filmmaker and an artist yourself offered critiques of art or maybe art capital A is better, that art education is still very Eurocentric, that museums still privilege the white audience, that white male artists are assumed to be neutral while women and BIPOC artists are seen as political. I'm wondering to what extent you think that art created for spaces outside of the museum, films, web series, graphic design, design, murals, et cetera, offer spaces for artists often excluded from museums, but also have the potential to undermine, destabilize, and maybe democratize art, question mark? Um, for me, there is no real difference if I do art in a museum or outside a museum. I've done art outside a museum. It's the same message as inside a museum. And in the end, it somehow lands inside the museum because white people have to go outside the museum to understand the message to then invite me to come into the museum. But uh, so it's not really for me when I, I, I can only speak for myself, but when I produce art, I have a message. And it's not that, you know, I literally, oh, I'm going to make this piece for a museum, you know, because I want a museum to show my art, so I'm going to make something. No, I don't, well, I don't work like that. I have something to say, or I want to visualize something, and where it, so for me, it's not a difference if it's inside or outside of the museum. I think that um, where the problem lies is in the structures of museums generally, but that's something that throughout my career, I have, I don't, limit myself by. So if an institution doesn't want me, an institution doesn't want me, but it doesn't mean that I can't do my art and have don't have this, you know, the same message as I would. Well, maybe my message is because I'm not in the museum. I don't really know, but I'm in first and foremost, I'm an activist and not an artist. I wouldn't even consider myself being an artist. Like I said this morning, I'm a communicator. I communicate through art. Art is my channel, but art is only one channel. I'm also a director, a performer. I curate also more than I would do art myself, I think. I'm a filmmaker. I, I write books. I write articles, essays. So I'm, I do a lot of different things and I have and use whichever channel presents itself to me to say what I have to say in that moment. And I, and, and I think if I would identify as an artist, then I would have the goal or the aim to show my, my work in a museum. But that's something that I really don't, I don't have. I don't have this understanding that I have to do something that is shown in a museum. Um, that's really not how I work. And I think it's, um, it's, it's something that I've prof profited from, not leading myself uh, or not following these structures, to put it in the words of Audre Lorde, in which we were never meant to survive. Yeah? So I think that's, that's the only way I can stay also authentic to myself, is by not letting myself be pressed into the box of these structures and all the conditions you have if you, if you want to do something. I'm not saying it's impossible. Like, 
the Biennale was an all black curatorial team, so there was nothing to discuss. Um, it was actually the message of the whole Biennale that I literally just fit into. So it, it, it literally depends. It depends on the institution, how institutions function, how the structures of these institutions are. But for me, I've shown my art outside of institutions and inside. And for me, it doesn't change the message of my art, of my work generally. I would, I would think so. Not for me, maybe for the, for the audience, but not for me. Thank you. I let's follow that up with one more question from the audience from Eileen. Uh, could you speak to how the film was received at the Berlinale, especially by the white audience, and how did that differ from perceptions elsewhere? Um, interested to, to piggyback on that white receptions in other countries there as well. Mm. The film was perceived um, at the Biennale, I would say by the Biennale audience um, better than I had ever expected. Um, it was rated uh, as the critiques in the newspaper and arts magazines was so positive, I was literally blown away. I was not expecting anything like that because those were not the moments that were important for me. One moment that was important for me and where I, I knew I had done the right thing at the, um, at the um, at Öffnung, what do you say, at the um, opening was that all the women were there and had invited their friends and friends and family to come. And there were a lot of women friends of Nadu in the age of Nadu, 60 plus. And they went up to watch the film and I was thought, oh my God, what are they gonna say? Oh, my elders, you know? And then um, they came back and they sat down and um, I think it was these three women. And first of all, they said nothing. And I thought, uh oh, what's, you know, how are they gonna react? These are reactions that for me that are really, that really count, you know? And then they said, um, after a long time, really a long moment of silence, um, one of them said to me, Natasha, thank you. Thank you so much for including us. This is such a beautiful commemoration to the, the black women of the 70s, the 60s and 70s, many of them who didn't survive because they were on drugs, they were on alcohol. This was a time where there were a lot of, um, a lot of um, suicides through heroin and especially in Berlin at that time. And um, she said up to this date that the community has forgotten us, had forgotten us. And you, this is such a beautiful commemoration to them. And that for me was a perception that counted, that really, touched my heart where I knew I'd done the right thing. That's what I did it for, you know? And that counted for me more than all the other beautiful positive press. I'm not gonna say I'm, I'm grateful for that too, but those were the reactions that really counted. You know? Imagine yourself, can you imagine yourself I mean, you've worked a lot. So the some of the artists were also featured in uh, on on book covers of yours. Can you imagine yourself uh, in engaging with you know your, when the different artistry that you portray in 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 Melissa Bachen? Can you imagine and what type of project? Can you imagine coming out of um, further engagement with these particular artists? Can we highlight them a little bit more to uh, uh, show the audience just uh, the diversity of what you call this audiovisual quilt in uh, a recent article? And and how and you know because you you were saying that uh, you know you found uh, and met artists that just you know that were just beautifully able to be infused into this entire uh, story is showing just this, uh, this continuity too of, of, of uh, Black uh, uh, thought and, and, and artistry. 
in, um, yeah. yeah, can you Black tell German us a little bit more? Especially Black German thought. This was important to me, or, or at least lived experiences in Germany. This is important for the film. And um, what I have um, planned, what I always wanted to do, this was uh, the first project that came to mind after making the film was that I want to curate an exhibition with the artists and their artworks, yeah? And um, I'm actually doing that next year now as well. I can, I can talk about that. That will be um, in May and on the 6th of May um, till July in Osnabrück. So that's my former hometown. There's a, um, a, a gallery there that um, it was in this, this, this wake of George Floyd that I got so many phone calls and Natasha, do you want to do this? And Natasha, do you want to do that? And we want to do an exhibition on racism, da da da. And I'm like, no, uh, I'm not doing an exhibition on racism, but I do have an idea for an exhibition for you. And then I literally sold her the idea of this exhibition, which she loved and which is now titled I Am Millie. And so um, the artists from the film will all be exhibiting their work in this. Well, not all of them, but some of them exhibiting their work in this exhibition. And I have also invited other Black women ex, um, artists additionally who weren't in the film to complement this, um, this exhibition. And it's I am Millie because we all are Millie, each and every one of us. Millie is, um, she's our, She's our elder, she's our big sister, so to say, in a, in a historical sense. And um, so we're, we're all Millie. And that's why the, um, the exhibition will be called I Am Millie. And that's coming next year, shortly after the exhibition in the Kunsthalle about Millie herself, which will be running for a year in that musician, so, uh, in that museum. So it's becoming part of the permanent exhibition on who she actually was right next to the painting, because the painting is there, and right next to that, there will be this whole wall of installation on who she was or where I found her and tracked her. And then in this Kunsthalle, there will be an exhibition with these artists. So yeah, I, I always wanted to do that. I think one of the um, works, do I have the book here? Yes, yeah, one of the works from, um, let me just quickly show you, from Marcia also became the book cover, Black Feminism. So I worked with a translation team and translated the original works from Sojourner Truth, Angela Davis, Barbara Smith, the Combay River Collective, Audrey Lord, Kimberly Crenshaw, and Patricia Hill Collins into German, where, um, and showed with the text that I, I chose that intersectionality is actually rooted in Black feminism. And like everything else, all black con concepts in Germany, people, white people like to run away with them and whitewash them. And so we were in the middle of this, this feminist debate 2019, where everybody was talking about intersectionality, but nobody was recognizing the black woman in this context, no? And even when the um, publishers asked me to do this, they were like, no, we don't want a book on intersectionality. We want a book on black feminism. And I looked at them and I, was, I, 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 I quit discussing. I said, okay, I'll do the book. No? So I chose the um, text to actually prove that intersectional, um, intersectionality, intersectionality, it's theory, um, is, is, is the foundation of black feminism. Yeah? Um, yeah, and that changed the feminist debate in Germany as well. Yeah, so that's kind of like how I work with institutions I don't discuss with them anymore because it just costs me too much of my energy um, yeah and this is the cover by the way is by Maciel that's why I started with this the cover is by Maciel it's actually a really huge picture that she painted and I thought it was beautiful to show black women in their different um, shades and shapes and sizes and the color of a book called black feminism so I will always include their works in some way. The mask at the end of the film is actually now hanging in my living room in Germany. So, yeah. Wonderful, thank you. Um, uh, I, uh, a, a question in the chat that might fit here came in, what can actually Afro-German men have to this world? Um, and I, 
you know, one one of your early books, Alphaism, is talking about um, hip hop and the hip hop genre as a communicative tool. Um, and up until, and, and there you discuss Brothers Keepers um, and the impact of Brothers Keepers. Um, and up until recently, you were also a politician in uh, a German hip hop party. Um, where, thinking about intersection, thinking about hip hop, thinking about politics in Germany and party systems, where do the men uh, fit into this world? And uh, <laughs> where, where do you do you see uh, hip hop as also a, a tool uh, of, of revolutionary thought? Not only hip hop, but all forms of music. And I think that's really important. Um, W.E.B. Du Bois already said in his uh, book 1903, The Souls of Black Folk, that music is a special form of communication for black people, for the black community, for the black world, always has been and always will be. Doesn't matter how much white people try and run away with everything, you know, be it jazz, be it hip hop, be it techno, all black music, you know. And I think in, in this sense, it's not only about lust and leisure and oh, let me relax and listen to music. Music was always a form of power. It was always a form of resistance in the black communities. It doesn't matter to which age, be it spirituals, be it gospel, be it blues, right up to techno, which in Germany, hardly anybody really knows that techno is black music anymore, that it started in Detroit, underground resistance. These things are not, the messages are not transported. So um, I wouldn't reduce that to hip hop, but hip hop, um, especially maybe is, is my age. I, I grew up in the hip hop age, if you so will, in the eighties and nineties coming out of the funk into the hip hop era and then uh, into this whole German hip hop sector, which has brought Deutsch rap, which the, the world doesn't need. Um, it's this, this new form of, 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 of music. <laughs> I wouldn't even call it hip hop because it's not a new form of music going on um, in Germany at the moment. And um, I think that um, it's quite interesting because um, during that time you mentioned with the Brothers Keepers, um, that was, hip hop was all, all, always, and this is a critique to hip hop, always been a very um, male dominated um, scene. And in Germany, it was that as well, especially um, the black hip hop scene was also male dominated. There was also the um, equivalent to the brothers keepers were the sisters keepers. Um, they did be they're beautiful tracks, but not, they weren't as popular as the brothers keepers, you know? And, um, what we're not allowed to forget is that this whole hip hop movement in Germany came at the same time Afro Deutsch came, Faber Beken came, and Maya Yim came. So these were like parallel movements, yeah. And they were both influenced by US Americans. On the one hand, Audre Lorde, we know that part of the story, but the um, Black German hip hop movement was influenced by Africa Bambata, the Zulu nation, yeah. So um, the first um, black hip hoppers like um, who became popular were, were advanced chemi chemistry and Torch was actually a member of the Zulu nation, so-called, you know? And um, so these were parallel movements where I would say that the, the, the hip hop movement was male dominated, which is a critique to hip hop anyway, but why the women are so strong in our movement in the black community in general, is because the community was born in the feminist movement. Yeah? So this is where, where we as women, we never had to fight for our space in this movement because we created this movement from, from day one. If you look back at Audre Lorde, at um, the women's movement at, at Farber Beken, feminism, black feminism, intersectionality was always the baseline of this movement. Yeah? And so for me, it's not surprising that there are more, um, more, more women are active, especially last year in 2020 um, with Black Lives Matter, you, you saw women in the front, you saw women at the front lines. But this is for me a continuity 
if you compare it with other European countries, for example, with the UK, women are fighting sexism in the black community, yeah, or France, women are fighting sexism in the black community. That's, I'm not saying that we don't have sexism in the black community, but I think our role and our position is, a diff is different, yeah, because you, these are things that, um, I like telling our brothers every day, no, they never forget where you came from, no. So for me, if you're not if you're not a feminist, especially a male feminist, also in this movement, there is no space for you. No, that's what I how I would conclude. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Um, let's see, let me comb through questions here and remind everyone to please add some more if you have it. if you have them don't be shy yes tic-tac-toe preceded both brothers and sisters keepers um yeah, tic-tac-toe was pop culture tic-tac-toe wasn't hip-hop tic-tac-toe was i mean one of them wasn't even black i mean come on we can't really take that as serious hip-hop can we <laughs> No. I, um, Sisters Keepers also had some uh, some figures uh, that were in the hip hop game for, I mean, just thinking of Melly, for example, yeah. uh, for quite some time and um, Absolutely. some of the first ladies of uh, on the scene, yeah. Black German hip hop were in Sisters Keepers as well, right? Um, Absolutely. Yeah, and you know, and, and when we're talking about intersectionality, uh, I'm, you know, in black feminism, I'm just sort of reminded, of course, that, it, you know, the black feminist movement in uh, Germany was also um, a, a queer uh, space yeah. in, uh, uh, you know, at least for a big, for a big- Absolutely, yeah. For a big part of it, and, 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 and that played a really Im important role absolutely yeah thank and, um, you for mentioning that that is really important also um that that um queerness um lgbtq trans identities um homosexuality gender i multiple gender identities were always were had also their their place in this community yeah especially through audrey lord being a um, um, black feminist lesbian warrior poet, as she coined herself, as she called herself, was um, she 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 was the one that literally, where Adifra grew out of this movement from the beginning. It was like nothing nothing that it, it's inseparable. You cannot separate um, queer identity from this movement neither. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I. Well, I, I I think I wanted to um, hark back to uh, the Obama and I know hip hop part time and um, your your many different hats from the author scholar uh, a professor filmmaker you, you you said it right uh, in in theater as well uh, po politics why how did that happen and now and now you're here. Well, to cut a long story short, to, for the hip hop, for the, for the Urbana, I would say that um, I've been following that. I was following them from the beginning, um, practically from the outside, always, you know, giving them tips and this and that and insight. And um, what took the last decision why I, I stepped out of the party, because I'm not in the party anymore, was because I'm an activist, <laughs> that's what I can say. And there's a huge difference between being an activist and a politician. Yeah? Um, being a politician and especially um, in, in the political party in Germany, you're a party of the people and not only of the black people. And this is a group that I choose to primarily fight for. To I want to, I want to um, empower the black German community um, and make space for the black German community. And as a, as a politician, this is not all that you can do. No? And this is where I choose to put my energy. So I left the party um, fairly early and um, also saw my potential, especially in, um, in academia, 
to be able to further um, academic debates, uh, research, to um, that's that's what I do. So I was reducing my hats, let's put it that way, uh, leaving the party, but also gaining space for what I do because in, in, in politics, what I do is limited. There are so many rules and regulations and I don't really have time for that. Thank you, thank you for clarifying that. Um, um, going back into the chat uh, and uh, Mohammed asked, in the film, you're not there, but you let the other women speak for you. I would like to hear from Dr. Kelly about her own Natasha's Abahan. What would that be? <laughs> um, actually, I it was a conscious choice not to be part of this film or not to be actively part of this film, because um, of course I'm telling a story as well, right? I'm not telling my personal story, but I'm the, the collective narrator, yeah? So each of these films tell an individual story, each of these eight films, but together they tell the collective, they tell a collective story. And I'm the collective narrator. I'm the one sewing the pieces of the quilt together, if you so will, no? Whereas each of these quilt pieces were made and created by the women themselves, I was the one to put them together to make one piece out of it. And so in a sense, I am there. You can also, if you hear, you can, you can hear me in the background sometimes, because I could just, couldn't stop laughing at some points where we had to do these sequences again and again and again. And every time we did it, I just had to laugh harder that was especially when Masia was in this garden saying, um, looking through, I don't even know what it was, um, this, this, this statue. Um, oh, I, I'm, you hear me laughing. And, but I think um, it wasn't time for me to tell my story. I'm not ready for that yet. I think that um, when I reach age, whichever age that will be um, in number, but I'm not ready yet to, write my biography, I'm coming closer to it. So I think that my writing in general is becoming more biographical with every piece I write, but I wasn't in the, in the, in the place to do a film about me for the Biennale and especially not for the Biennale. This for me was, I see myself more curating this film than actually producing it as a classical filmmaker because it was made in an art context and not for the film Biennale, you know? And my awakening, I don't, there, there, are, there are moments where I can definitely say, yes, um, this and that happened in my life along the way of my nearly 50 years now that I, um, I definitely will one day write down, but not today. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, it's a wonderful place to uh, start uh, ending our conversation and uh, seeing if there are any other uh, questions or um, if you want to uh, tell us a little bit about your newest book or uh, any other book or anything that you think is missing. Yeah, well, alongside all the art projects that um, I already mentioned that are happening next year, I'm actually also writing my new book um, because what I think is missing in the German context is um, a historical overview of black feminism in Germany. And this is also something that came through the film after Nadu told me her story and seeing how many gaps we have in the 60s and 70s. I went searching and found the black, first black woman who I would maybe call a feminist. I don't know if she would call herself a feminist, but that was in 1743. And she was a contemporary of Anton Willem Amel. So um, that's what I'm writing about. And that's how far black feminism goes back in Germany. And um, I think it's really important um, to read about black Germany from people who have the lived experiences I really have to repeat that because I know a lot of is being done in the US and I'm, I, I'm, I very much appreciate it um, in that, you know, we find black studies or we find black German studies within 
um, in Black Studies or in Africana Studies or at different universities, because we definitely don't have that in, Ge in Germany, not yet. This is um, top of my bucket list is to create a Black German Studies Institute in, in, in Germany. But at the same time, um, I really have to express my the feeling of um, especially being a, a, a visiting professor here in the States and um, actually now being part of, of um, what is, is happening here in academia, I very much feel objectified by um, a lot of Black scholars who think they can um, research Black Germany without even having any, any kind of tie, um, tie to it, tie to our experiences. This is something that, um, that I really have to say that um, it's, um, you're no better than white people if you, if you look at us like that in that way and write about us in that way and, and work on us in that way because we're not a species, we are part of the diaspora. And this is um, what I've come here to do, to, to bond, to bond with the African diaspora in the United States. So on that note, as we draw to a close, many thanks once again to our sponsors for allowing this event to take place and Dr. Kelly for sharing her film and time with us. Please visit our website on bghra.org and follow us on Eventbrite, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to learn about future events in our All Black Lives Matter series. November 17th, we invite you to join us for the screening of another documentary film, Becoming Black, and a conversation with the film's director, Enos Johnson Spain. Our YouTube channel hosts the recording from Dr. Kelly's classroom visit this morning, along with all of the earlier conversations in this series, and from our four international conferences. Mark your calendars for February 17th to the 20th, 2022, when we will host our fifth BGHRA conference virtually in partnership with Africana Studies at Rutgers University Camden. Remember that you have until tomorrow evening at 8 p.m. Eastern to watch or rewatch Millie Zervakin. And don't forget the dual language text is available for purchase by emailing Dr. Kelly at info at natashakelly.com. Thank you again for your time and attention. And until next time, have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you. And thank you for the invitation, Rosemary, Emily, Kavina. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank, thank you everyone you. for joining us this evening. Good night.